I know what you're all thinking. That was grim, Lucy. Where are we going with that? <laughs> well, we're going to find out, aren't we? So uh, let's pray and invite God to come and really powerfully move amongst us um, this morning. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you have so many things to, to teach us and to reveal to us. And we pray this morning that very simply, Lord, that we would set aside any distractions that we've brought in here and just put them to the side and just focus, focus and fix our eyes on you. We pray for open, open ears and open hearts this morning. And we pray that you would do a mighty work amongst us. For we ask this, we trust this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said. <coughs> Amen. Excuse me. <coughs> um, so it's good to be back preaching with you uh, this morning. A big thank you to Rebecca Ogilvy, by the way, last week, who literally got a phone call last minute. And I'm like, Rebecca, are you willing to step in and do a kids' talk? And she was like, yes. Can we give her a round of applause? <laughs> like, she's, she's great. Rebecca, the next step is preaching, so get, get ready for it, get ready for it. But uh, folks, let's be really honest with uh, one another this morning. How many of us have ever had this kind of conversation in our head before where you've said something like, how could an all-powerful and all-amazing God use somebody ordinary like me? Anybody ever thought that before? Yeah, yeah. How many of us have felt that way lately? I'm not asking you to put your hand up, I'm just asking you to think about it. I am sure at some point in all of our lives that we have said things like this before, and maybe you can resonate with them. How could God possibly use someone like me because of my past? Have I ever been there before? How could God possibly use someone like me because of my background? How could God possibly use someone like me. I do not have the right skills. Anybody been there before? Yeah, yeah, we all have. I have too. And this morning we are kicking off a brand new sermon series for the month of July called Ordinary People, Extraordinary God. And the whole premise of this sermon series is to help us realize that when it comes to being a follower of Jesus, God is not looking for superheroes as followers. He's simply looking to put his hand upon ordinary men, ordinary women, so that he can use them to advance his kingdom. And I love what it says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. It's on the screen. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And I believe that so often we get caught up in thinking that we have to have status or position or the perfect background or the perfect job or some sort of authority in life in order that we can be used by God. But folks, I want to tell you now that that is not the story of Scripture. When you read it, that is not the story of Scripture, is it? When you read the Bible, what you see is that God puts his hand upon ordinary and more often than not broken people's lives, just ordinary broken people's lives, and he does something extraordinary with it. You following? Anybody ever heard of a guy called Oswald, Oswald Chambers? He said this, all of God's people are ordinary people who have been made extraordinary by the purposes he has given them. And so this morning, in light of all of that, we are going to be looking at someone who God set his hand upon to be a blessing, just a totally ordinary person. And his name was Shamgar. You're all looking, what? What? Surely that's not in the Bible, Lucy. You're making that up this morning. Has anybody ever heard of Shamgar? Does anybody know a Shamgar? If anybody is pregnant here this morning and having a boy, um, then put that on top of your list um, because that would be such a great name, wouldn't it? Shamgar, solid, solid, solid. Shamgar is mentioned ever so, 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 so briefly in the book 
of Judges. Like literally, it's a sentence. And we find it at the, in the book of Judges, chapter 3, verse 31. Now, I didn't ask Elizabeth to read this little bit because I didn't want to give it away. So sorry to disappoint you. We're not talking about someone being impaled um, this morning um, in the passage that was already read. But if Elizabeth had just read on one more verse, this is what it would have said. After Ehud, so I'm not making it up, came Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. He too saved Israel. Boom, moves on. That's it. That's it. And if you've got a Bible here this morning, you can read it. There's nothing else that comes after that. That's all we hear about Shamgar. And as I was reading and reflecting upon this verse, I was thinking, how could it even be remotely possible that this man, Shamgar, who is mentioned ever so briefly here this morning, teach us, can possibly teach us anything? It's just a sentence of scripture. But here's the thing. God's word, regardless of how long or how short it is, has something to say to all of us. And believe it or not, I feel there are two very valuable lessons that we can take away with us this morning, all from this one sentence of scripture. And here they are. I believe that as we look at the life of Shamgar, this ordinary guy, we will see that Shamgar shows us how God uses those with willing hearts. And then secondly, I believe that Shamgar teaches us about trusting God to use what we have. Okay? So that's where we're going this morning. But before we get to that and before we consider what the Lord has actually sent to us, we really do need to consider the context of what is going on. Otherwise, the significance of what happened won't make any sense to any of us. So... What I want you to do is I want you to go back in your mind all the way back to the Old Testament for a moment. And I want you to think about the life of Moses. We all know who Moses is, right? Yeah, yep. Well, we saw how the Lord used Moses as this mighty leader. And in a few weeks' time, Aaron will be preaching and he'll be picking up um, on the story of Moses. So you'll hear a wee bit more about that. But as we know, Moses died And then who stepped up to the plate after Moses died? Yes, well done. Get a prize later. Some sweets. Yeah, Moses died and then Joshua uh, stepped up to the plate and through the mighty power of the Lord, uh, Joshua went on and led the Israelites to many victories, okay? But then, just before Joshua dies, there's this really interesting chapter in Joshua 24 where we read this really interesting discussion between Joshua and the Israelites. And it really is worth hearing this morning. So we are going to read it. It's not going to be on screen because it is quite long. But what I would really love you to do is, if you haven't got a Bible, to listen really intently. And if you have got a Bible or a phone, pull it up um, and I will tell you what the reading is. It's Joshua 24, verse 14 through to 28. So if you're getting a Bible or... um, getting your phone app out. It's Joshua 24, verse 14 to 28. Joshua 24, 14 to 28. I'm going to read that to you now. And the little bit is titled, Choose Whom You Will Serve. Now just listen to this conversation between Joshua and the Israelites. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness, Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, far be it from us, that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us out and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will also serve the Lord, for he is our God. 
But Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witness against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord, our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the, large, in the book of the law of God and he took a large stone and he set it up there and that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, behold, this stone shall be a witness against us for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he has spoke to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. Really interesting conversation between Joshua and the Israelites because what the Israelites are saying here is no matter what happens, no matter what happens, we will serve the Lord. It was almost like they were saying to Joshua, don't you worry a thing about it, Joshua. We have got this. We are going to stick by our word. Far be it from us to forsake him. Now, Joshua then dies at 110 years old. And if you flick over to the book of Judges, guess what, folks? The people don't serve the Lord. They don't do that. They don't do what they said they were going to do. And we read this in Judges 2.10, verse 12. It's on the screen. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lords and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They aroused the Lord's anger. Does that sound like a people who said they were going to do what they were going to do? No. And actually, folks, I don't know if you've ever read the book of Judges before, but the book of Judges is a really heartbreaking book about the Israelites' rebellion against the Lord and their sin. It's not an easy read. And in the book of Judges, what we read is that people did what they liked, when they liked, how they liked, and who they liked to do it with. There was violence, there was corruption, there was darkness. In fact, several times in the book of Judges, what we see is this thing called the sin cycle where the Israelites rebel against God. They become oppressed. They cry out to the Lord to, to save them. The Lord saves them. And guess what? They go on the sin cycle again and again and again. Seems pretty dark, doesn't it? You're thinking, when are we getting to the good bit, Lucy? But actually, folks, that's the context that we need because into the darkness of all of that mess, into all of that corruption, God in his infinite goodness, his grace and his mercy, he raised up several judges to bring about salvation to the people of Israel. And amongst those who God rose up, he used Shamgar, this totally ordinary guy to be a deliverer for Israel at a time that they needed it the most. You know, <clears throat> when it comes to serving the Lord, or when it comes to really, quite frankly, doing anything in church, sometimes we have this habit, don't we, of talking ourselves out of doing it, don't we? We say the things like, do you know what, if only I had enough time. Or if only I had such and such personality. Or what about this one? If only I was as creative as such and such. Or my background isn't really quite how I imagined it to be, so I couldn't possibly be the right person for a job in a church. And before we know it, what we are doing is we are looking at everybody else and looking what other people can do and then looking at ourselves and thinking, do you know what? 
God couldn't possibly do something with me. And if that's how you have felt, or if that is how you feel this morning, then you need to hear this clearly. It is not about who you are. It's all about whether or not you have a willing heart. And that's what Shamgar teaches us this morning. That's the first thing I want us to look at. It's not about who you are. It's about whether or not you have a willing heart. Now, like I said, there's nothing really to go on in Shamgar here. I mean, it doesn't tell us a whole lot, so I had to do a lot of digging um, around to find out a wee bit more about his life. So from doing a bit of research, we are told that Shamgar was a farmer. We are told his name is not an Israelite name. We are told that, and some actually say that Shamgar was a mercenary of an Egyptian army. And in terms of where he came from and his genealogy, It says there in the text that he was the son of Anaf. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, obviously, that's his dad. Surely, that's his father. But actually, some say it possibly was more to do with being connected somehow, some sort of Canaanite goddess, that Anaf actually wasn't the father. It was a relation of some sort of goddess. So when you put all of that together, here's the backdrop of Shamgar's life. A farmer an outsider, an Egyptian mercenary, a non-Israelite. And the Lord uses this outsider, non-Israelite, Egyptian mercenary to deliver Israel. Doesn't seem right, does it? Like, when I look at the mess of what's going on here in the book of Judges and all that corruption and all that violence, I would be thinking that surely someone of of stature, someone of power, someone of might, somebody who is really strong, like a warrior type of person, might be best suited for going into a situation like that and sorting it out. But God chose Shamgar, this farmer boy, this ordinary guy, to be the one who would make a difference. You see, God isn't all that interested and how strong and powerful you think you are. And you know how I know that? Because Psalm 147 says this, and I just love, I love this. He's not impressed with horsepower. The size of our muscles mean little to him. What God is actually interested in is whether or not you have a willing heart. Because the reality is God is willing to use those who are willing to be used. You see, from Shamgar's perspective, that day, that time, all that's going on, he was just looking as an outsider in. He sees what's going on. He knows that something needs to be done. But it was like nobody else was willing to do anything. Nobody else was willing to step in to make a change. But Shamgar did. He did something great for God. He saw that there was a need and it was like he stepped into that opportunity that opened up the doorway for God to put his hand upon his ordinary life and do something extraordinary with it. Now, I wouldn't blame Shamgar if he had a whole host of reasons as to why he shouldn't have been the person chosen for that job. I mean, he could have said things like, have you seen my background? My background doesn't fit the job description of what you need done, Lord. He could have said, I can't serve, Lord, in this way because I am not the same as them. I'm actually an outsider. But what I love is that that actually Shamgar didn't let his background discredit him from being used by the Lord. And yes, he may have seemed like an unlikely character, but like, let's face it, in the church and in the life of the kingdom, God uses unlikely characters all the time. And I know that's true because I'm one of them. So folks, you know what? You need to hear this this morning, that regardless of what your past has looked like, regardless of how old or young you think you are, regardless of whatever gifts you feel you may or actually may not have, God can use your ordinary life for his glory. I love this verse in Romans 12, one, it's on the screen, reading in the message version. So here's what I want you to do. 
And I love this bit, God helping you. So it's just a little reminder that here's what I want you to do, but you're not doing it alone. Take your every day, your ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. So here's what that is saying to us. Take your everyday things. Your everyday, your mundane life, if that's how you want to describe it. You're getting up, you're drinking your coffee, you're going to the shops, your day-to-day job, you're looking after the kids, you're going to school. Take all of that, all of that, and place it before the Lord as an offering and say, do what you will. You'll notice that nowhere in Scripture does it invite us to be extraordinary warrior type people first or ever, really. What you'll see instead is the invitation to depend on an extraordinary God. Do you see the difference? We're not called to be an extraordinary superhero. We're called to depend on an extraordinary God. And so I wonder this morning, have you got a willing heart? Is your heart willing like Shamgar or is it filled with excuses? Are you willing like Shamgar to present your ordinary life as an offering before the Lord and say, you have your way, not mine? And so I encourage you this morning to think about the state of your heart and the level of your willingness, not for us, but for him. But then ask, Lord, what do you want to do? Because Shamgar shows us that God is looking for those with willing hearts. But he also shows us and teaches us the importance of trusting God to use what we have. Now, every single one of you in here has something in common. We all have bits and bobs in the house. Who has a bits and bobs drawer? It's a mess. Nobody ever wants to open that. You can have the most pristine house in the world, but there's always that one drawer, isn't there? That's just awful. But I wonder, um, does anybody have, the picture's going to come on screen, um, this bad boy lying about the house? And if you do, I'm just going to call the police. Um, So that, that, maybe don't admit to that. But uh, this is, uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe somebody knows what that is. Does anybody know what that is? It's a toothpick. <laughs> For horses. <laughs> I'm only joking. It's, um, it's called an ox goad. You've ever heard of one of those bad boys? It's an ox goad. And basically, it's like this farming um, implement where it's about eight feet long with this really sharp end and basically uh, farmers would have used it to kind of poke and prod the animals so that they would go in the right um, direction and Shamgar being a farmer would have had one of these instruments as his tools and in the text if you've got it open there we are told because that's all we're told that Shamgar killed 600 Philistines with an ox goad with one of those 600. Now, we don't know if that was all in one go. I'm trying to visualize that, but that's dark. Um, so I'm not going to do that. But over, he may have done that in one go. He may have done it over a period of time. I have a notion. I don't know what the answer to that is. But the point is that God did something supernatural with what Shamgar had in his hand. Now, let's just think about what's actually happening here for a moment. So Shamgar, this farmer, this outsider, this non-Israelite, this potentially Egyptian mercenary related to a Canaanite goddess person, um, is faced with, what, 600 Philistines. So the odds here, which we're not placing bets, um, is 600 to 1. Now, there are people who likely came at Shamgar with all sorts of weapons and all sorts of things. And Shamgar, this ordinary bloke, this ordinary farmer who stepped up to the plate with a willing heart, he's basically armed with a stick. A stick. He's got one of these. So why Mount Marion Church has an ox goat, I don't know. (laughs) 
<laughs> this is for opening windows, just to put that out there. So here he is, armed with his stick. That's all he had. But folks, that is all he needed. Now, Shankar could have said, I'm not going to battle. What do you think I'm going to do with this stick, this ox goat? You know, I haven't got the right tools for the job. Surely you could give me something better to fight with. A sword, a shield, even a bow and arrow would have done. But no, he's got an ox goat. Shamgar was willing and he trusted God would take whatever simple offering, ordinary offering he would have and God would use it to his purposes and glory. In his hand was an ox goat, but God put his hand upon it and did something supernatural. And you know, folks, I find so often that we are way, way, way too busy making excuses about the things that we don't have, that we miss what's right in front of us. I was listening to a a podcast quite a while back, and the guy said that if we don't use the gold that God has given us in our hands, the enemy is going to come along and he is going to goad you. And he is going to goad you by saying, you're not good enough and you don't have the right background, and you're not creative enough, and you haven't got what it takes, and you haven't got the right skills, and the enemy is just going to keep on goading you. As it says in 1 Peter 1, 5, 8 on the screen, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And so when the Lord asks us, what do we have? Do you know what our response sometimes is? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. And we think of the list of reasons as to why we can't do something for him. But you know what, folks? That's okay because we're not the only ones who have ever thought that way before. It's recorded in Scripture that loads of people felt like that too. When the Lord asked the widow woman in 2 Kings 4, what do you have? Do you know what she said? Nothing. Just a jar of oil. You know what the Lord said to her? Watch what I can do with a little oil. Shamgar, what have you got? I've got a stick. Watch what I can do with your stick. Folks, we need to stop with the excuses as to why we think our ordinary lives and things that we have to offer, regardless of how small or insignificant we think they may be, they can be put to use. Because ordinary things trusted in the hands of an extraordinary God are used for great things. Think about the New Testament even. Think about the five loaves and the two fish. Ordinary things. But they became an extraordinary miracle in the hands of who? God. As it says in Ephesians 3 verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or think or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. So if you have ever been in doubt that the ordinary things of your lives can't be used for the kingdom, then you need to be encouraged today that as we close, that if God can use a farmer, just an ordinary guy with a stick, to deliver the people from the corruption and the violence and bring about salvation in the day of Israel, then he can use whatever you have to offer him with your willing heart. Let's pray. For some of us um, this morning... um, Maybe some of that has resonated with you, that you have said those things about yourself, that I'm not good enough, or I couldn't possibly um, use, have the right skills, or my background isn't how it should have been. Then I pray this morning that you would hear and be encouraged by the Lord that those are the lies of the enemy, and that God can use anyone. And I pray this morning that in an attitude of surrender, and in an attitude of willingness, that all of us would walk away this morning and ask that question, Lord, what do you desire of me? 
What have I got that I can use for the kingdom of God? And I pray that all of us would, would set aside the excuses and just embrace all that the Lord wants for us. So come, Holy Spirit. Use our ordinary, everyday lives as we present them and place them before the feet of Jesus. For we ask this in your name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.